Even before the official Paris Motor Show got underway, Volkswagen was here to present its new models to the press. And the new Passat GTE was the star of the evening. Just like its best-selling cousin, the Golf GTE is a plug-in hybrid drive, this time in the midsize class. In E-Mode, the Passat GTE has a range of up to 50 kilometers. After that, the combustion engine takes over. With a full tank and battery, the range is about 1,000 kilometers. That would take you from Paris to London and back again. The seal. Volkswagen's Martin Winterkorn says the Passat GTE is another step in the direction of meeting Europe's goal to reduce passenger car emissions to 95 grams of CO2 per kilometer by 2020. Hybrid cars can help make that happen, so VW is investing in the technology. BMW's slogan at the Paris Motor Show this year is, let the sun shine in. And one of the sunniest ways to do that is with the new 2 Series convertible. BMW's Habe Dies calls it the sportiest and most dynamic convertible in its class. It's grown a bit and features more comfort and a very powerful engine. With over 300 horsepower, the M235i is the first performance model in this segment. Prices for the 2 Series convertible start at close to 36,000 euros for the 2-liter gas-powered model with 184 horsepower. The open-top four-seater will go on sale just in time for the 2015 season. The soft-top roof is electrically powered, so it opens and closes in just 20 seconds. Opel is celebrating four world premieres at the Paris Motor Show. The Mocha, Safira, and Insignia have benefited from revamped powertrains. Then there's also the slick and spirited new Adam S. And as a real highlight, the new Corsa. Opel's Carl Thomas Neumann says the Mondial is always a hit. The first Corsa debuted here 32 years ago. This is the Corsa 5. Audi also has a debut at the Paris Motor Show, the new TT Roadster. It features a folding cloth roof, aluminum to keep weight in check, slightly reduced length, and up to 310 horsepower. Like its hardtop brother, it sports a sharper revamped design. There's also the signature single-frame grille and trapezoidal headlights. The modular construction also helps limit the weight, which boosts responsiveness. All-wheel drive is standard on the powerful Sportback version, which sprints from 0 to 100 in less than 5 seconds. Audi's Ulrich Hockenberg says the Paris show is one of Europe's premier car events. Paris takes place on even years and Frankfurt on odd-numbered ones. So it's where Audi can show Europe and the world what it's got in the works. Musically accompanied by One Republic, Mercedes is presenting the next generation of its B-Class. Available with every kind of engine, including fully electric and natural gas. A new fender and a wider twin slat grill round out the facelift. Mercedes CEO Dieter Zesche says the B-Class has been super successful in its three years on the market. They're aiming to set the pace again. The redesigned front end features LED headlights, plus there's an upgraded interior with bigger monitors. There's a natural gas version and a fully electric version. All that makes the B-Class the most versatile car in its segment. Porsche is using Paris to unveil its fourth generation Cayenne. First on stage is the Cayenne SE Hybrid, the first plug-in hybrid in the premium SUV segment. It's a frugal giant, officially using only 3.4 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. That's 79 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Porsche's Matthias Müller says the problem with alternative engines is that they still cost more than conventional ones. The customer has to decide whether to shell out for a more sustainable and eco-friendly car. Diese umweltfreundlichen Autos kauft oder nicht. 
In Paris, Toyota confirmed its status as one of the most innovative manufacturers worldwide, presenting some fascinating concept cars. The world's number one car maker plans to best the competition with a mass-produced hydrogen engine. The yet-to-be-named fuel cell vehicle will be available first in Japan and from next summer in Europe as well. Another world premiere in Paris is the Seat Leon Experience. With permanent all-wheel drive and special experience badging, the youngest member of the Seat family offers driving enjoyment that doesn't stop when the road ends. This all-terrain wagon rides higher than the Leon ST with a higher clearance to match. The design features robust protective covering on the side sills and wheel wells. Eye catchers include the gutsy front end with big air intakes and integrated fog lights with turn signal function and the front spoiler with aluminum trim. And Skoda is looking to Paris to bust out of its image of sensible and somewhat frumpy cars. Care for a t-shirt? Here, you can create your own design and take it home. The Czech brand is also presenting its completely revamped Fabia Compact in various versions. The Fabia is Skoda's first model series to display the design's evolution toward more expression and emotion, with accents from motor racing. It's a showcase of crystalline forms, sharp lines, and precision in every detail. And the party over at Mazda is celebrating the 25th birthday of its iconic MX-5 Roadster. Whereas generations two and three stayed close to the MX-5's original design, the latest version is completely reworked with a noticeably more modern look. The hood conceals the newest high compression gasoline engines of the Sky Active series with either a six-speed manual or coming soon, automatic transmission. And Nissan is taking the VW Golf head-on with its Pulsar series. At Paris, it unveiled a completely redeveloped series featuring an extra roomy interior. See the future of driving at the Paris Auto Show through October 19th. Peugeot has given its 508 a facelift. The mid-range model is available as a sedan, crossover, or station wagon. The station wagon is the main body variant, and around 80% of buyers choose it. Powered by an 88-kilowatt gasoline engine, the base model sells for just over 26,000 euros in Germany. Swedish carmaker Volvo will launch production of the XC90 in early 2015. The second generation SUV will be built at Volvo's Torslanda factory near Gothenburg. It offers a wide range of features and typical for Volvo plenty of safety equipment. Only one engine option is known so far. The Drive E diesel produces 165 kilowatts and consumes just under 8 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. Sasha is taking a look at the Jeep Renegade. Renegade can mean someone who deserts one country for another, and that could apply to this Jeep, which sports an all-American design but was built in Italy. But before we start thinking about spaghetti westerns, let's see what the Renegade can do, especially off-road. The new compact Jeep is available with many extras and engine variants. That's unusual for a Jeep. It also means it's no longer necessary to import the cars from the U.S. Besides the Sport, Longitude and Limited variants, it's also available as a top-of-the-line Trailhawk. That's the one we're driving. It is also the most expensive and costs 31,900 euros in Germany.
Sasha realizes quickly this Italian is the equal of its American stablemates in every way. That's a good sign. Jeeps first got their start back in the 1940s with the Willys MB. The U.S. Army built it as a small all-terrain vehicle. That history is still visible here, since 1941 is embossed on the dash in large letters, and Jeep hopes some of that tradition will rub off on this Italian model. We'll have to see if it works, but there are other allusions to the original 1941 Jeep. The Renegade has visual cues to the early Jeep in many places, beginning with the trademark grille with its seven-slot vertical grille. The tiny X within the D on the Renegade badge is a nod to the spare Jerry that Jeeps once carried. This X can also be seen in the taillights, and you can even see hints of the iconic front end in the rear lights. The trunk's maximum capacity is just under 1,300 liters. In 1941, the interior of the Jeep was very simple. Today, that's fortunately not the case, but it's still not what you'd call luxurious. The Jeep is available in two gasoline and two diesel engines. Performance ranges from 81 to 125 kilowatts. Sasha says five driving modes assist the driver off-road. Here in the auto mode, crossing the terrain was still a snap, which means there's still plenty of latitude for harder terrain. The Renegade is available with front and all-wheel drive. The Select Terrain Assistance System has settings for snow, sand, mud, and rocks. The rock setting is only available in the trail hawk and activates the rear differential lock, thus enabling a low creep speed and greater control in demanding terrain. The first Jeep had no problem with water. But we don't recommend trying that today. But even so, the off-road capability is remarkable. Its suspension can travel 20.5 centimeters, so it can master even the biggest bumps. And on the road, the Renegade cuts a good figure in our test drive thanks to its firm suspension. But it's a lot more exciting away from the pavement. Sasha says testing off-road cars is always a perk of the job, and the Jeep Renegade is no exception. But it's also well-mannered on-road. We'll have to wait and see what the Fiat counterpart, the 500X, will bring. The Fiat is likely to be a bit cheaper and perhaps almost as good. A Jeep made in Italy may be a switch, but Sasha's always been a fan of Italian movies, too. Meet the BMW 503 Cabriolet, a car that wowed car lovers. It was the first German car with an electric soft top as standard equipment. Its chassis was entirely of aluminum. It was the first mass-produced car with a light alloy V8 engine, and the sound was music to the ear. In 1956, BMW brought out the company's most expensive model up to then, the 503 in the coupe and convertible versions. Each sold for 29,500 marks, the price of a single family home. Mikhail Pritschkow has owned this 503 Cabriolet for 16 years now, and he's still thrilled by it.
He invites us to imagine it's 1956, just 11 years after the end of World War II. Suddenly, there's the first car with a V8 engine and 140 horsepower, and it can go 190 kilometers an hour. That's stacked up to the Mercedes 300 SL with its gold wing doors, which was a gigantic car. There really wasn't much else like it in Germany at the time. For him, the 503 still tops it all. The 503 Cabriolet was a luxury car for factory owners and film stars. Wealthy industrialists like Count Faber Castell and Rudolf August Ertke drove them in the 1950s. The elegant two-door model took home gold medals from the car shows in Cannes, Rome, Lisbon, and Vienna. Michel Pritchot waxes enthusiastic about the car's power, comfort, and size. The technology is simple, nicer than in modern cars. The 503 holds four people comfortably, making it great for holidays. And that's without sacrificing sportiness. The only thing to slow him down is when there's traffic on the road. The aluminum chassis was built by the chassis specialist company Bauer in Stuttgart. The design didn't follow any trends from abroad, BMW came up with it on its own. The 503 marked a turning point in BMW design, a shift from pre-war taste to a leaner and more modern look. The understated pontoon shape did without flashy effects and followed the ideal proportions of a Gran Turismo car, a long hood, and a short rear end. In its technology, the 503 was based on the big BMW sedans, the 501 and 502. The frame, engine, transmission, and axles were almost identical. For its fans, the 503 still ranks as the most beautiful car of its day. Michel Pritchot always loved the 503's design. It's an absolute eye-catcher. The coupe is already a looker, and the convertible is stunning. It's still the pinnacle of what BMW has to offer. The interior is impressive too, with its clean beauty and 1950s aesthetics. Three round gauges inlaid in a metal dashboard, and a few ivory-colored buttons. In 1956, this was the state-of-the-art luxury. But the 503 came at a difficult time for BMW. Few people in post-war Germany could afford such exclusive cars. BMW produced only 139 of the convertible version over the course of five years. By the late 1950s, BMW was on the verge of bankruptcy. The company rescued itself with small cars, like the Isetta and the BMW 700. But of course, they didn't have the luxury or the power of a 503. The engine, the world's first cast aluminum V8, was a masterpiece of German engineering. Two carburetors fed it fuel. Later versions had output of 119 kilowatts. At the time, even Mercedes was offering only six-cylinder engines. Michel Picho loves taking his convertible for a spin here in the Bavarian Alps. These days, the vintage beauty is clearly an exclusive ride, but on the road, it draws admiring rather than envious glances. Oh, 
It's a familiar scenario. He's out on the road and another car passes him. The driver and passengers glance over and their jaws drop. There is a flurry of pointing and other cars slow out and the passengers all start snapping pictures on their cameras and cell phones. It's all good fun. Today, a 503 convertible in good shape will set you back a quarter of a million euros. When it comes to vintage cars, BMW's 503 is a crown jewel.